Hi, I'm Kristen, and this is the Simple Handmade Everyday Podcast, where I talk about living a creative, intentional life. I like to chat about quilting, sometimes knitting, what I'm reading and watching, and a little bit about self-care, productivity, and keeping a cozy, organized home. I've got my cup of tea in hand, so grab yours and let's settle in for a chat. This is episode 83. Welcome, friends. How are you? I hope that you are settling in for whatever activity you like to do when you listen to a podcast. I've got my cup of tea here, which today is ginger mango, or maybe it's mango ginger from Yogi Tea. Um, I have been battling some issues with my stomach. I've got acid reflux, and so the list of things that I am not supposed to eat or drink are truly joy-stealing They include coffee, tea, alcohol, chocolate, anything with tomato sauce, anything spicy, anything fried, um, onions, garlic. I mean, obviously, I'm not going 100% on this, but I have cut down to one cup of coffee in the morning as opposed to just two, but then I used to just drink tea all day. And, um, but ginger teas, and I tried some decaf teas. It turns out it's not just decaf, it's actually tea. <laughs> Although I think decaf may be marginally better. But so I ordered this, this decaf tea thing. And um, most of those things I can't really eat, drink either because they're acidic. There's a raspberry and a peppermint and, um, oh, what else? A lemon. Oh, citrus. That's another thing I'm not supposed to have. Yeah. I mean, Everything that I eat is spicy or has lemon squeezed over it or some kind of vinegar or something. <laughs> I guess I know where I, I, how I got into this position. But ginger tea is supposed to be good for you. And so I found this ginger mango tea and I'm getting used to it. I drink a couple cups a day. The other one that I've been liking is um, a throat coat, which we had on hand for when people had sore throats. It's a very nice tea. And the reason I, I I already had it, but I was looking for um, tea with slippery elm, which is supposed to be good for this. And throat coat is one of the ones that came up. As a matter of fact, it's the only one I found. So I've changed my tea drinking habits and I mean, it's going okay, but I'm a little sad about the whole thing if I'm being honest. (laughs) So anyways, um, Thank you for all the people who reached out to me. I kind of confessed on the last couple of podcasts that I've been in a little bit of a funk. Um, I don't know if it's pandemic fatigue or what, but I'm beginning to feel better. And I think, um, you know, I, I kind of know why. And one of the things is that, you know, I got creative. I, I dug into some creative pursuits, which when you're in a funk, Sometimes all I really want to do is just like watch my little shows on Acorn TV or listen to books or something. And and I have a hard time making myself do uh, other kinds of creative pursuits, like getting back into the sewing room and and quilting or knitting or whatever. Um, But I just kind of, you know, got in there. Um, I did some quilting. We'll talk about that later. Some I started playing around with my Zentangle, um, which became a failed 100-day project. (laughs) Um, I've been outside and gardening and here in Southern California, you know, it's actually, we're having a little cold snap right now, but the weather is beautiful. Um, we're getting out early into the yard this year to kind of get it spruced up for spring. And, you know, I, I just fully believe in sunshine is, you know, one of the best remedies. So, um, so that has really helped. And you know, what else I think really helps is spending less time on social media. Um, I just really find that I open those apps and I kind of scroll for a few minutes and go, you know what, there, there's, there's nothing here for you. Um, which is not entirely true. I mean, I have met all kinds of people that share the same creative interests as me, um, through Instagram and Facebook and, and podcasts and things like that. So, um, but you know, so easy to overdo it and, um, I don't need to keep, you know, adding to that. So, so I've been really, um, getting off of social media and then, um, just having some things to look forward to, uh, the kids, you know, are coming home. Um, my youngest came home for the president's day long weekend, and that was so great to see him and just, 
help him fill up on good foods and vegetables and all the things that are so hard to get at school. So that was um, that was really nice. We spent some good time together, watched some movies and, and stuff. So that was great. And then my daughter's actually coming home this weekend. <laughs> so I told my, my other son, you know, okay, if you come the weekend after that and we just can keep rotating you guys through, it'll be like, you know, you never moved out. And it's kind of fun having them here one at a time. You know, it's great to be together as a family, but the one-on-one -on -one attention is pretty awesome. So that's been been great. Um, in other news, my, my husband went back to work in the office um, just like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So that's kind of, a, I think, a nice schedule for him. He's got the long weekend um, at home. I mean, you know, it's, you don't have to worry about getting back to the office. And and uh, so that's been a little bit of an adjustment for me. I'm actually recording this at like three o'clock in the afternoon on a Wednesday. And I usually do these things on the weekends. And there's really, I can't really um, explain this. There's no reason I could not have recorded a podcast while my husband was working from home. I just would have done it in another room. But somehow being home alone and having the place to myself, I just feel like <laughs> I could just do whatever I want. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing this during the week because, um, yeah, I keep having kids come and visit during the weekend, and I don't want to miss any of that. So, um, so yeah, it's just it's kind of nice. It's feeling like life is getting a little bit back to normal to have some uh, time and space on my own. So I hope everything is going well with you guys as well. Um, and before we get into our quilting content... I'd like to thank The Fat Quarter Shop for sponsoring the podcast. The Fat Quarter Shop is a one-stop show for quilting fabrics and supplies for quilters around the world. They stock quilt shop quality fabrics, pre-cuts, quilt kits, patterns, notions, and even cross-stitch supplies. And now, Fat Quarter Shop has launched the ninth annual charity quilt along called Heartfelt. So this is already underway, but it is not too late to join. They've just released the first block. And so the way this works is that they offer the Heartfelt patterns as free downloads during the event for a suggested donation of $5 each to the Make-A-Wish of South Central and South Texas campaign. You can also make one larger one-time donation of $50, but no amount is too small and every bit counts. So from February to September, they publish a new pattern on the Heartfelt Announcement blog post on the first Friday of each month. So at this point, just the February block is up there. And they also have kits featuring Cory Yoder's line, Beautiful Day, and it is beautiful. But all the fabric requirements to sew it in your choice of fabrics is also available. It's a gorgeous quilt featuring a heart in every block, but they're all a little bit different. It's absolutely adorable. I'll put a link in the show notes, and I highly encourage you to participate. So let's talk quilting. I wanted to give you a little update on my scrap quilt, um, which is the, um, what's it called? Shadows and Sunshine block, um, and it's 12 blocks. And I'm really, I'm making some good progress on this. Every block is, um, features 12 different fabrics in one kind of colorway. So I'm challenging myself to, to use my stash, even though it's a whole quilt, but all I really need is basically a five inch square from each of these 12 fabrics. So I'm not exactly putting a dent in my stash here, but it's been really fun to sew. And it's been, um, a challenge in a good way to um, look at all the blues and find the ones that really to you know go together are, are really um, in the same color family and stuff that's been fun but I need to do 12 blocks and I don't have enough colors so I reached out to my friend um, Francis and she sent me and I just got them today some orange squares and some purple squares because I absolutely do not have enough of those things in my stash to come up with 12 fabrics fabrics that that work together so I will be um, really looking forward to to doing that um, probably tonight I'll, I'll play around with those and see if I have a few more of mine to add in so that'll be really fun um, I'm really pushing it on my own I've done a now a gray block and um, a, I've done a dark blue block and like a navy and then more of an aqua and now I'm doing and a green but now I've got like an aqua to the green block and a what do I want to call it a pinky purple like more like a fuchsia -y. I, I happen to have a bunch of fabrics from one line 
um, that I bought years ago and I've used for different several different projects but um, so they all kind of work together and I'm definitely pushing the bounds of the color family on that one so I'm not a hundred percent sure it's gonna look good but I can you know swap some things out um, when it's on the design wall so so that's been really fun and that has um, kept me busy and I think has kind of lifted my spirits. I've, I've been reminded of a few things when you really get into sewing a block based quilt. I'm doing two blocks at a time and um, and they are uh, comprised of, uh, what would that be, four by four, 16 um, four and a half inch units. And um, yeah, I really can get into a real chain piecing thing where I lay them, I stack them up. I learned this from Krista Watson. When you're doing a lot of the same block, I just stack the all the pieces on top of each other. So I've got, you know, the whole different color blocks right on top. And then I can just chain piece and everything stays in, in position. I don't know if that really makes sense, but it's, it was kind of a game changer for me. The other thing um, that I was reminded of is to uh, leave a little something that's easy to do like don't finish up you know your block and so that you have to like I don't know go choose fabrics next time or something like what I did last time was I just left like um, some blocks that I just needed to do the final press on and then I could move on because um, there's something about overcoming you know, if, if you have something easy to do, then you can come overcome any um, friction, any resistance you have to going into the sewing room, which is weird because we do it because we love it. But I do see, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know where to start, you know. So I'm like, okay, what I need to do is just press these. And then you feel inspired and, and it's easy to just, you know, keep going. So those were two little things that I was reminded of um, doing this, you know, really block-based quilt. Um, now... QuiltCon. QuiltCon happened and I was supposed to go to this one and I didn't. It was in Phoenix which is really not too far from me but for a number of reasons it did not work and I always think that I'm going to feel okay about it until I start seeing all the posts on Instagram and you know I've been to a couple when they were in Pasadena and so I know what it's like and it just makes me sad. I just you know you feel like you're really missing something but it, it was it was what it was. Um, there were definitely a few things that would have been nice to see. My friend Patty Dudick had um, three quilts at QuiltCon. Three! Isn't that amazing? And um, I loved all three of them, and I would have, just would have loved to have seen them in person. My friend Holly Ann actually was a sponsor and had a booth there, and I haven't seen her um, for a while. We met up at a QuiltCon one time, and that would have been really fun to, to catch up on. But, oh, man, I just love looking at the quilts in real life it's like going to a museum um i've been to you know several different types of quilt shows but none of them really get me the way um quiltcon does and modern quilts i've really got to figure out how to start making modern quilts because i love them or i love most of them and um yeah, so it is just, it's its so inspiring to, to see what people have put together. And some people are absolutely so talented. And the math that some of them have to do to make these things work out, I find completely just amazing. I'm also so glad that Hillary Goodwin won Best in Show. Um, you may know her as Entropy Always Wins on Instagram, and I'm always so inspired by her Her quilting. Um, she does amazing, um, she sews amazing clothes, plus she's a, a doctor, and she's a great photographer. Uh, she's just absolutely amazing, so I was, I was glad that she got the recognition that she deserved. I think my favorite quilt, I've got the QuiltCon um, winners up here in front of me, it was a second place in piecing. Let me just double check that that is true. And it is called, it was sponsored by Orifil. Yes, yeah, second place in piecing and it's called Rhythm and Blues. I'll put a link in the show notes, but it is absolutely gorgeous. And this is one of those ones where I feel like I don't even know how the math worked on how she did this, but it's different colors of blues that overlap each other in that, um, you know, transparency kind of way, you know, where they change color, where they overlap. And it is, absolutely stunning. Um, the one that won the people's choice and first place in piecing is called Pride and Joy and it is amazing. It's a portrait quilt of a woman and her two um, young sons, you know, like I don't know, maybe four and two or something and she's holding them and 
it's stunning. It's it's almost photorealistic. It's absolutely gorgeous. So um, so those are a couple of real highlights for me. I'm sure that you've seen them all, so I don't really need to go through them. But I'm looking and and I I did notice a few things. I feel like um, you know I always like to look at trends. I don't think I really looked at enough to really get color trends here, but um, still a lot of curves, still a lot of curves in modern quilting. Um, I was really amazed at uh, what was, I don't know, I, I wasn't organized enough to write down what this was called, but I saw this quilt that was overlapping circles and um, large circles and I zoomed in on it and, and their piece, and it almost looked like you would have had to applique that to get the way they overlap so perfect, you know? Um, and, and so that just, that engineering just like completely amazes me. So um, yeah, just a lot, a lot of circles, um, still a lot of your just straight up improv stuff, which honestly does not speak to me on the same level as some of these things that are just, um, you know, a little bit, uh, I don't know, more planned or something. Um, well, I was talking to my friend Frances about this, of the off-kilter quilt, and um, she noticed, and I agreed, that the the level of skill and technique in the quilting has is like ratcheting up like every quilt con, <laughs> I, I feel like. Um, I remember, I felt like the first few, it was a lot of straight line quilting. That was like the new thing, and which is harder than it looks. Uh, but I remember the last one I went to realizing, oh, there's a lot more free motion, even incorporating traditional elements like feathers and swirls. Um, but yeah, they between, yeah, free motion quilting and then a lot of handwork. There's a, some amazing hand quilting work done here. So that's a traditional technique that people have really um, added to the, the, not that they weren't doing it before, but it's something that I, I noticed this time. Um, so speaking of the hand quilting, there is um, a woman, Heidi Parks, and she is an amazing artist and modern quilter. And she, I don't know how through the whole quilt con thing, I got over to her website and became completely intrigued by this technique that she calls improv hand quilting. She does a ton of hand quilting, like whole cloth and, um, and you know, also on pieced quilts. And she's got these really amazing pieces of improv hand quilting. And I said, I'm going to try that. And so I kind of zoomed in on, you know, some of her pieces to see what she was doing. You know, I'm not a great uh, improv person. I kind of like to have a plan. Um, but I cut out uh, basically about a 23 by 23 inch square of this um, linen this Japanese linen fabric that I've had for many years, it's an Akino fabric. Um, it's the, actually the, the colors are not really my taste anymore, but I thought this, is, this would be cool that, you know, because it already has a print on it and found some um, 12 weight orophil thread in gray, um, you know, so pretty neutral and um, just went at it and just kind of looked at what she did to kind of get an idea. One thing that she does that I think is really cute is that she has exposed knots. So you start on the top of the fabric and you pull it and so you've got these, you know, in a way little tassels here and there. And I just started um, stitching some free form, gent you know, gently curving lines. It's hard to be gently curving in a way. <laughs> um, and, and just, you know, kind of started going different directions. But I spent a, a good few hours on Sunday afternoon. I even talked, had a long conversation with my dad on the phone while I was just messing around with that. Um, this fabric has some large magenta flowers and I just played around with like, doing a little swirl, a little spiral in that. And I don't know what will become of this, but um, it, it seemed really fun. I will link her in the show notes as well as she actually has um, an on-demand uh, improv hand quilting class. And, and I may take it, I may take it. Um, I do know a lot about hand quilting, so uh, there's part of me that's just not sure how much. It's like, I feel like I'm probably gonna want one piece of this class. It's an $85 class, do not begrudge for that price, but I'm just not sure. Yeah, I'm just weighing that one. But I, I would love to take it because, um, yeah, I just, I think that this, this is like, a talk about your zen flow state type of, of sewing. And that's one thing I gotta say, one reason I've not really embraced improv 
quilting in terms of the piecing, although I've tried it and I've, I actually have a little, you know, project in process, but it doesn't like speak to me on the, on the, my soul level, the way some other techniques do. Partly I think because it's, um, a little more chaotic than my brain likes. And the other thing is, um, I sometimes feel like when I sew, I'm looking, I love to chain piece, you know, I'm looking for that meditative state and I, sometimes do not feel like I want to be making a lot of decisions and when you just when you do improv um, quilting you know you're you know you're making decisions as you go and that's a totally cool thing too but sometimes not what I'm looking for late in the day so anyway so Heidi Parks improv hand quilting and I feel like it's she's got the corner of the market on it if you google it and stuff like she's the only person that really comes up <laughs> <laughs> about it because it's it's kind of a, a unique idea so you may want to check that out oh the other thing um, that I loved was seeing all the quilt coats so I'm sure by now you have heard all about the the Mary Fawn's YouTube video called quilt clothes must die um, I would just like to go on record that as much as I appreciate the fact that she is looking out for the legacy of, of us quilters, um, I think that people can do whatever they want with the quilts that they own, that they make, that have been passed down to them. You know, not every quilt is going to end up in a museum. Not every quilt is museum worthy. And sometimes giving a an old quilt, a cutter quilt as they are sometimes known, a new life as a jacket or um, Christmas stockings or stuffed animals or all kinds of things that people do with them. Um, I mean, I think that's just in, in a way honoring, just keeping that going. Yes, that will be probably the end of the road for it. But I mean, I've got a number of um, quilts that are from my husband's grandmother or great grandmother. And, um, you know, I mean, the, the batting showing through in some places, you know, I mean, we just kind of stopped using them because they were just falling apart. But so where are they? They are in the linen closet. Um, I am not personally going to cut one up to make a quilt coat, but if somebody else did that with theirs, I have no problem with that. But there were so many amazing quilt coats um, on display at QuiltCon, so that I found that to be um, also just, you know, really in inspiring. And who knows if I may make one of those. I would probably just, you know, make up quilt panels of my own to do that. Um, but, but yeah, I would love to know what you guys think about the whole, you know, Mary Fonts. Um, controversy. Um, I think she turned it into a controversy on purpose. She was giving a, a lecture about, I believe, um, quilt and fashion at QuiltCon. And I have, and I was curious how that video that preceded her lecture, how they were going to work together. But I have not found anything about her lecture at QuiltCon. So I need to do a little bit more digging. So if you know how that whole thing panned out, I would love to hear it. Also in the spirit of creative projects, I, um, <laughs> I started a 100 day project and what I decided it was going to be was, um, a Zentangle. So Zentangle is this kind of way of doodling. I got a book for Christmas and I do enjoy doing it. I have not gotten very far on it. Truth be told. Um, so I started this on a, the first, I think it was a Sunday. That was the first day of the hundred day project. That was a couple of weeks ago and, um, I've only done two days. So, I probably should have set a reminder. So I should know that I'm not good at these types of, you know, block a month or hundred day projects. I mean, it seems like a really cool idea. And literally the books, I put my sketch pad and pencil and the Zentangle book right on my desk where I sit every single day so that I would see it and remember. And I do not see it at all anymore. It has become part of the furniture to me. So, uh, well, you know, uh, just not, not my thing, apparently. Okay, so books. Let's talk about books a little bit. Um, I have been enjoying, I'm just going to tell you just about a couple. Um, on my Kindle, I'm reading The Little Shop of Found Things. I don't know where I heard about this book. Someone recommended it. It's by Paula Braxton. Uh, as always, there will be links in the show notes, so you don't have to write that down. Um, so I'm going to tell you about two books that I'm not finished with either of them, which is always dangerous, but I live, like to live dangerously. I'm mostly done with this one and it is a fun story. It is a story about a, um, young woman and her mother 
who um, are going through a big life change, divorce, blah, 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 and they are opening an antique shop which is, I guess, what they had before. So they're opening a new antique shop. And what's so this is there's a little bit of a magical realism element to this. Um, and the daughter, uh, whose name is Xanth, um, she has this ability, this, this, I don't know, superpower that sometimes when she touches an object or holds it, she um, sort of sees the story of where it came from, or at least she gets you know, like visions or feelings or something, you know, she, she gets some sort of an emotional, but sometimes visual response to these objects and which only, you know, helps with their, with their business. Um, but in this particular, um, story, it kind of goes a step further where, um, she is drawn to this, I think it's called a, sh a Chatelaine, um, which has a whole, you know, um, sewing thing too. I know Jenny Byers has a Chatelaine that's got, you know, like a, I don't know, like a thimble and some scissors. So it's, it's like a little silver thing um, that ha like housekeepers would um, have fastened to their, their waistband or something. And it can have um, little things that you might need. Scissors, a sewing kit. Um, this one has a little, um, little tiny notepad. So just little things like that. Um, and that the, the, so they're always handy right there at your waist. And so she's drawn to this and it has particular, uh, powers where she ends up, she goes, um, back in time. She's kind of becomes a time traveler to try to save this young girl's life. And, um, because she does have, um, a lot of background in, um, antiques and stuff, she does know a lot about the time she's in, not a ton. She's definitely stumbling through, um, how to speak in a way that doesn't draw attention to her. She doesn't really have the right clothes, all kinds of things like that. Um, but, uh. So it's the story of her trying to um, complete this task of helping this girl so that things all pan out. And um, so it takes place in two time frames, and it's uh, very entertaining. So that's been nice. I'm almost done with that one. And then I've been listening to The Huntress by Kate Quinn. So Kate Quinn wrote The Rose Code, which I believe I um, talked about in the last podcast, and The Alice, ne ne little Alice Network from... Uh, a year or two, probably two years ago. And I just decided that I really like her. So what else has she written? So she wrote this um, book called The Huntress and it's got a very good narrator. So I'm listening to the audiobook just from Libby. And it is all about, as Kate Quinn's stories always seem to be, World War II. And um, this takes place in a few different places. Um, but uh, the US, this is, it takes place mostly after the war where um, this guy and uh, has a little business where he is basically hunting down war criminals. The Nuremberg trials are over, but, you know, they didn't catch everyone. So he just, you know, like catches three criminals, three, you know, Nazis a year. And, um, and that's what, what he does. And that's how he kind of keeps himself sane. So, they, he's looking for someone now called the Huntress, um, was her nickname. They, they didn't know very much about her, but it was a, um, a woman who was um, basically uh, hunted down Jews and killed them. And, and really, I mean, this sounds terrible, but, you know, she maybe only killed 12 or 15 instead of millions. So she was not a priority to find, um, but she killed the this the the main character his name is ian she killed his brother and so it is a personal vendetta for him to go find her and she is now in the u.s under uh an assumed name and just you know completely has changed her life and um so it um, goes through uh, three different characters um, and how, how they all fit in, people who are looking for her, the family that she's now in integrated herself into, and um, I can't wait to see how it all comes together. Um, so, but that is called The Huntress by um, Kate Quinn. And the last book I want to talk about um, is um, a book that I thought maybe um, I'm not the only person that would benefit from. It's a book called Exercise for Better Bones. And um, because I because of my history with breast cancer, 
And the fact that I had my ovaries out when I was in my 30s and went right into menopause, I have um, some, I'm, I don't have osteoporosis, but I'm, I'm kind of borderline. So it um, is important for me to do strength training and it is something that I've been trying to integrate into my life for many, many years. And I hate it and I don't do it the way I should. I should lift weights like it's medicine. Um, but I, I don't always do that. So, um, and part of it is that I'm the kind of person that I don't, you know, kind of like the way I'm with quilting. I don't want to make it up as I go. I want someone to go, I want you to do 10 of these, then 10 of those, then 10 of these, and then you're done. You know, I just, I want the straightforward program. And I've had a hard time finding that. I've looked at Paula B. Um, she integrates a lot of cardio and I for me I need to lift heavy weights so I sometimes think that when she does the weight workouts that they're um, maybe not I don't want to use the word intense enough so I just kept looking so this has been good it's a Kindle book um, I actually got it right now free from Kindle Unlimited but it's only like five dollars I think um, as a Kindle book if you buy it and um, it has links over to a website um, from this it's called Melio Guide or something like that. And she um, has a YouTube channel where she explains how to do all these exercises and, and has like a 12 week program at different levels and stuff. So like, this is exactly what I need. I'm just gonna check these things off. So that has really helped me kind of move forward with that goal of mine to get an established um, strength training routine going. So that's called Exercise for Better Bones. She also has books um, on posture. Um, she really integrates um, flexibility, balance, and posture as well as strength, which, you know, I think we can all use no matter what your age. Um, but yeah, she's got a book called Exercise um, or Yoga for Better Bones too, if that's kind of more your thing. But I'm going straight for the weights, baby. So that's about it on books. All right, let's move on to shows. We are the kind of people that um, we only have streaming services and we kind of rotate through them and we cancel them and start them up depending on <laughs> the shows that we want to watch. So we recently finally canceled HBO and um, which I'm, we're going to have to go back to because I want to watch The Gilded Age and I did not even try to get hooked on it because I knew I wouldn't be able to finish it. Um, but we dropped that and got Hulu so that I could finally get back to This Is Us. So this is the final season of This Is Us. And I don't have a ton to say about it except for that I am enjoying it. I'm all caught up. I think there were five episodes for me to catch up on and now I have to wait like everybody else for them to come one by one but it's been um it's been a great season so far delving into things like um you know Jack's mom and um some you know interesting things with um obviously with the mom Rebecca and so anyways, I don't know if you guys have, are watching that show, but um, This Is Us is, man, it is just such quality writing. It just, it really is. And they, they're tackling some really, um, some big issues, you know, like Alzheimer's and um, just, you know, a lot of the, the family dynamics that, that we all deal with that are, of course, all on steroids for a TV show, but, but things that we can relate to. Now, this other show, we just actually watched the last um episode in the season um, and it's also in Hulu it's a Hulu original called only murders in the building this show is so fun it has Steve Martin and Martin Short and Selena Gomez who I have to say I don't know what the deal is but her voice is different um, I, I've watched enough Selena Gomez when she was younger I'll grant you that but there is something up with her voice um, I find it a little bit distracting to be honest with you, but this is super fun. So this is this, um, the idea here is there is this beautiful, probably very expensive apartment building in New York city called the Arconia and they all three live there. And, um, there is a murder in the building. Well, first of all, actually all three of them are huge fans of a true crime podcast. And it's interesting to, um, watch them so you're just like it's like a bunch of people who are what you know listening to serial together or something if you guys listen to that um but but when the podcast drops they all listen to it like as soon as it drops which like who does that <laughs> i mean like you know it, it drops at a certain time and so you know it's like okay it's sunday at eight i need to go home and listen to my podcast um 
But uh, so, you know, they're all just like sitting there listening, like doing nothing else. Like, who also does not do anything else while you're listening to a podcast? But anyway, so they listen to their, so they're fans of this true crime podcast and they all, um, you know, figure, find out that, that they're all into this. And so they uh, bond a little bit over that. But then there is a murder in their building and they, you know, kind of get swept up into, um, kind of low-key investigating it and then they decide that they are going to do their own true crime podcast about this murder in the building and um i was actually the the name only murders in the building like irritated me for a while till you find out what it means um and i don't think i'm spoiling anything um by saying that at some point someone brings up like there's there's another murder somewhere else that they could also they could do a different podcast on that one and at that point steve martin says no only murders in the building <laughs> like we're limiting ourselves to that and so um and that's the name of their of their podcast so it is delightful you got the whole um different age dynamic um steve martin plays a um an actor who used to be like let's just say he was like a, a columbo or something like that he um but not like kind of dumb like Columbo X. But he was a, an actor in a show, long running. Everybody knows who he is, like Columbo. And um, he's n like now long retired from that. But, you know, he kind of feels like he has a little expertise in this from that. And then Martin Short is a producer, director kind of guy. And, and Selena Gomez is a little bit of a lost 20 something who um, is an artist kind of trying to figure stuff out. And uh, so they all bring a little something different to the um, to the podcast and to their little investigation. And there's a lot of twists and turns. And it was a um, it was a very fun show to watch. So I highly recommend that. And then we also we got Peacock so that we could kind uh, so we could watch the um, the Super Bowl, which we're not really into, but my husband wanted to watch the Super Bowl. So, you know, you can get Peacock for $5. For $5, we can watch the Super Bowl. And then that allowed me to watch Yellowstone. I feel like I'm the only person in the world that hasn't watched Yellowstone or Ted Lasso, <laughs> which I don't know how we'll ever get on the Apple TV thing. But um, so I'd heard a lot about Yellowstone. And um, so we're, I don't know, a handful of episodes into that, maybe maybe six or seven. And um, what it is, it, this has, it stars Kevin Costner. Um, it's basically Dallas, <laughs> but less glamorous. So he, he uh, Kevin Costner owns a huge ranch in Montana. Um, I mean, I feel like at, at some points they mention that since one of the sons took over something, they've added 200,000 acres to the ranch, added to it. So like, I feel like it must be like a million acres. It's huge. And, um, it's, it's kind of like it's Dallas meets Succession, <laughs> if you watch Succession, but he's got um, these kids, you know, one's a lawyer. They're, they're kind of all crazy in their own individual ways, um, and uh, some of them more sympathetic than others, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of soapy, but it's just, you know, him, uh, running this ranch and battling back the developments that, uh, you know, that he doesn't want that, that are bordering his land and he's got a ton of power and, um, but it is, has a whole, um, super rich family dynamic to it too. So, um, there is some like swearing and sex and stuff, but it's nowhere near like how over the top that kind of stuff is in the show Succession, which was too much for me. So, so I don't know. So I've been kind of enjoying Yellowstone. Um, I never would have thought that I would like want to watch something that was kind of like a Western, um, but so many people liked it. I decided, okay, I had to try it. So that was, um, that was entertaining as well. Before we head into our final segment, I wanted to thank Silk and Sonder for sponsoring the podcast. Silk and Sonder is a monthly journal subscription. So every month you get a brand new fresh start. I just got my March um, journal in the mail yesterday. and Every month has a theme and the March theme is wonder. Also, I hadn't really thought about it before, but every, um, 
every month has a color scheme as well. And so the March color scheme is beautiful. It's all blues and greens and purples, a very cool color scheme. So I'm just loving how beautiful it is. Um, so every month has consistent elements. It has habit trackers, mood trackers, um, sleep tracker, a coloring page, um, specific journal prompts about what you, uh, reflections about the previous month and planning for the, the upcoming month, as well as weekly pages, monthly pages, all those kinds of things that um, you just love to dive into, really make a, um, a journal like this work for you. But also every month it's new. So I'm looking through my March one here and um, it has um, a wheel of life page where they give you 10 different elements of life and you kind of rate where you are on on the scale of these and, and which might help you realize oh I need a little bit more in romance or I need a little more adventure or I need to focus a little bit more on my relationships um, and then there's always a journal um, page that really has to I mean there's lots of pages that have to do with the theme but in this case there's a page all about wonder and you just remember times that you demonstrated wonder and what wonder means to you and things like that. Um, there's a little journaling exercise. There's a gorgeous coloring page and a page of all your, your favorites, which is that's kind of a fun thing to track. They have a wonder gumball tracker, which is very cool. Um, so it's just like a little gumball graphic that you can just color in every time you stop. And um, and, and they, they have these for different um, of the different ones of their themes. Um, so anytime you experience wonder, you can color one of these in. And they actually perfectly fit. They have sticker packages that go with these. And I have one for my February journal. And they have little circles that go to help you um, for your habit trackers, little these little, um, I guess, hexagons for the mood tracker, which you can repurpose if you don't want to track your mood. You can track um, movement or you can just, you can personalize any of these types of pages just to work for you. And then they have some beautiful sticker pages um, that kind of remind me of washi tape just so that you can decorate your planner and um, make it yours. And I tend to be more of a utilitarian um, journaler. Um, I don't use a lot of colored pens and things like that, but the stickers make it really fun. And I'll be taking some pictures and putting those up in my Instagram stories of how I'm, I'm doing those pages um, because that has been really enjoyable. And Science has shown that taking time to journal um, and especially things like gratitude, but just getting things out of your head does wonders for your mental health. So I have really enjoyed digging into this, especially during the pandemic where, you know, we're all a little bit on edge, but getting things down on paper every day, getting in there, exploring the prompts, I have found absolutely invaluable. If you would like to give them a try, I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, and I have a link for you, but I also have a discount code, which is SHE15. Um, SHE stands for Simple Handmade Every Day, 15% off um, any subscription to Silk and Saunders. So give it a whirl. All right, let's uh, talk about a few other things like gardening. Um, actually, what I want to start with is um, one of the things that I have found that's kind of helped me pull me out of my funk is that I have identified four different projects in my life that I want to make progress on. And I write them in my Silk and Sonder journal every single week and then create some... Um, some to do's to move each of those projects along. And that is my, my goal. It, it doesn't have to be a lot, but every one of those projects needs to be moving forward as much as I can control it every week. So the first one is my garden project. And specifically, I wanted to convert our vegetable garden into a cutting garden this year. I've talked about it for years. I'm really doing it this year. So I have the book, um, Cut Flower Gardening from um, Florette Farms. And I signed up for her seed starting course, which is a free course. I'll put a link in the show note over to her website. Um, and I watched that where in it completes, it's a very good course where um, it's four videos and she is very good at explaining everything, but also telling you how to do this sort of on the cheap. So you do not have to buy, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of supplies. So I watched that. I actually made my husband watch relevant parts so that we could figure out where are we going to start um, these seeds in our house. 
And um, we did this years ago when we first moved in. We started um, all our seeds in the kids' bathroom. We had no kids and put a piece of plywood over the bathtub and hung um, a fluorescent light over it. And it worked very well. I think that might have been one of our best gardens. So that was kind of my plan. And then I bought some um, seeds. And, you know, I live in Southern California. So, you know, it's like 10B is the zone or something like that. Where, you know, like we basically never have to worry about frost, um, certainly not at this time of year. And um, so I started looking at the back of these packages and almost all of these seeds that I bought, which include um, dahlia, delphinium, zinnia, snapdragons, larkspur, bachelor buttons, coneflower, cosmos, and hollyhock. I've got 10 different flowers, all the tall varieties for cutting. And they mostly said it is recommended to sow them outside. Do not start them inside. They do not transplant well. So that kind of shifted things in a good way, though. So um, my plan now is I last weekend, I prepped the soil for the garden. And man, did it, I feel it in my back. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to say, you used to be able to go to a garden center and buy bags of compost. This does, does not exist anymore. They are called like garden topper. Um, or yeah, I don't know, silly, silly names like that, which I think basically are compost. I finally just had to buy some of that because I just, I just want a straight up compost. I also mixed some manure in there. So I prepped that whole soil and got it all straightened out, laid a path right down the middle of it. I've got two 27 inch wide, um, beds that are about 15 feet long. Um, and a, a little path right down the middle of them. So what I'm going to do, um, is I bought heat pots that basically kind of look like an ice ice cube tray so they're small and I'm going to cut them apart and I am going to start my seeds outside but I'm going to treat them like I was starting them inside in a little peat pot with seed starting mix I'm going to put the seed on top covered it cover with vermiculite which is how you do it if you're starting seeds and even it's that's very much like um if you've ever read the book square foot gardening by I think it's Mel Bartholomew he has you do that, but not necessarily in little peat pots, but I think the peat pots are going to help me keep track of where the seeds are. <laughs> and so, um, so this coming weekend or maybe the first weekend of March, that is my plan. We also bought from this place, um, I call gardener supply or something, a um, customizable soaker hose system. So I'm going to run these soaker hoses right down either side of these these rows. And in the book, um, Cut Flower Gardening, she explains how she grows these things because it's more, she does it like a sort of a farm, much more densely than if you were planting it just for landscape. Um, so like I've got a little nine inch grid going on that, um, that I'm going to plant all the things. And I think I'm going to plant half of it in March and then half of it a month later in April so that I do not have in the whole garden um, come to full bloom at the same time. You might wonder, what are you going to do with all these flowers? I have, I, it will be hundreds of plants, right? Not hundreds, over a hundred plants. Um, and I don't know, I want to be able to go to my garden and cut flowers to bring them inside to make arrangements whenever I want. I'd like to give them away. I'd like to make arrangements for other people. I would like to just look at them in the yard, even though I am plant them, planting them in a little bit more of a row-based system here. Um, I still think that it'll just look beautiful in the yard. So um, I'm excited. I've talked about this for years, um, but I'm finally, finally doing that and, you know, have purchased all the things that I need to go get going. So that, um, that project, I get, try to basically move it forward every week, not every day. Like right now, I'm just, you know, waiting for the soaker hoses to show up in the weekend so that we can plant. But I have everything ready to go. My second um, project is my health. That's my big thing for this year, and that's to lose weight and strength train. Um, so I've been, you know, moving forward, I, not so much for the, fir <laughs> the first month of the year, um, but I feel like I'm in a pretty good place right now. So that's something that I just make sure that I'm doing some my tracking and doing my exercise every day, kind of setting aside 45 minutes every morning to do um, cardio and weights. So, so that's looking good. Uh, my third project is to plan a, a big family vacation. 
and um, we feel like we're kind of running out of time to take um, the big the big bucket trip <laughs> bucket list um, trip. We were supposed to go to England in 2020. That didn't pan out, obviously. So we've um, regrouped here, and we'll see. I've looked into a few things. We've looked into going to the Bahamas, Hawaii, but I, I think we're going to try to do Italy. Um, so that actually is in the travel agent's hands right now. Um, but tentatively, Rome, Florence, and then Venice. So if you have any must-dos or must-places to see in um in Italy, let me know. It looks like maybe we'll be spending maybe three days in each of those places and then taking a train between them. That's kind of the tentative plan. Um, so I'm excited about that. I absolutely despise planning vacations, which is very weird for me. I'm a very good planner. I don't know why I don't like to plan vacations. So I have a travel agent I've used for many years and trust very much. So she kind of takes that out of my hands. And then my fourth project is the bathroom renovation that I've talked about before that Stephanie over at Make and Decorate podcast is helping me with. Um, this has not been an easy project. I feel like doing my kitchen renovation project, you know, I don't know, 18 years ago was easier than this. Um, I just cannot find the, the vanity that I want at a reasonable price. So I've gone through um, several different, um, what I'm now considering dead ends. Um, tomorrow I have a meeting um, uh, at Lowe's with the, you know, to, for some custom cabinets that we'll, we'll see if that pans out. Um, it's been nice to have Stephanie to, to bounce things off of. And um, so as soon as I can kind of, uh, take some steps forward here, then I'm going to meet with her again so she can advise me on things like lighting and paint and accessories and things like that. So I'll be glad when I get to that. Um, but this has not been easy. And I do think that the prices are crazy inflated. And maybe it's, you know, just because of where we are, COVID and supply chain, blah, blah, blah. But it's turning out to be like twice the price that I thought it would be. So that's depressing. But um, I'm easily overwhelmed, and so I just feel like if I just can take small steps towards moving this project along every week, then we will eventually get there by the end of the year. <laughs> so that is my mantra for the year is that, that small steps add up. Small things add up to big things. Um, I have been remiss in talking about reviews the last couple uh, podcasts, even though I've had some. So I'd like to thank A. Perry 61 and Debbie H. 63 for your wonderful, um, <laughs> wonderful reviews. So fun to, to read those. And I always love it when I find out that I have converted people to drinking tea who didn't drink tea before. <laughs> That's very fun. So if you feel so inclined, I love it if you'd go over to Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts and rate and review the podcast. It helps other people find it. Apparently, I did not name it very well if I wanted to attract quilting folks. So <laughs> I depend on you guys helping me to spread the word. You can find me online at my blog, Simple Handmade Every Day, where you will find the show notes with all the links that you need on Instagram at Kristen Esser. And please consider joining the Simple Handmade Every Day private Facebook group so that we can keep the conversation going. Have a wonderful week.